We're excited to be here to talk to you about the survey that we did on how you learn about learning disabilities. Um, so for those of you who, for whom this is your first webinar with us, welcome. Um, we are Dysgraphia Life, created to provide education, information, and helpful resources to people impacted by dysgraphia. We have about a dozen expert webinars on a range of subjects on our website. We recognize the importance of success stories and share those on our website as well. We also created a book recently on IEP goals for written expression to support that process. And we have a professionals database to help connect with tutors, occupational therapists, educational therapists, and others who can support people with dysgraphia. We're also currently in the middle of a project um, that we're really excited about that has three main goals, um, to raise awareness of dysgraphia or specific learning disability of written expression, as some people are more familiar with um, that terminology. We um, also aim to increase the amount of research on dysgraphia. Uh, there just isn't nearly enough that's helping to inform our practices, our testing, um, understanding what causes it, where it comes from. We also aim to ensure that the research that is being done is as meaningful as possible to our community. Um, and by community, I'm referring to people with dysgraphia, parents and guardians of people with dysgraphia, educators, clinicians, anyone who's working um, around this subject. I want to pause for a second to talk about what meaningful research means. Um, Jennifer and I use this terminology a lot um, to differentiate from just any research. So to us, meaningful research has a direct impact on the community affected by the issue. And it focuses on the issues that matter the most, not just something that someone thinks is interesting to study. Um, unfortunately, we see this a lot in, in the research space that there are lots of topics that lots of researchers and scientists think are really interesting, but they may or may not actually have an impact on the people who are directly impacted by it um, or directly dealing with it. So. That's, that's a meaningful distinction for us. We also want to say a big thank you to the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. This project was funded through a Eugene Washington PCORI Engagement Award to Dysgraphia Life. And without this, we would not be able to um, embark on, on this project. So this funded project aims to build a community of trained and activated advocates to advise on and participate in patient-centered comparative clinical effectiveness research studies while connecting them with researchers. And I'll come back and talk about what that means, comparative clinical effectiveness research. Um, the second aim is to identify promising practices for engaging parents, guardians, and other caregivers of students with learning disabilities. And thirdly, to develop a list of prioritized research topics that could improve health outcomes for those and other outcomes for those with learning disabilities of written expression. For the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna be focusing on the top two bullets. The third bullet on the list of research priorities is something that we're going to be excited to present to you all in the fall, and it's currently in the works. Um, but you may not be familiar with this term, patient-centered comparative clinical effectiveness research. It certainly is a mouthful. Um, what it means though is that it's patient-centered or person-centered, centered on the person who is impacted by the condition or the issue. Um, and comparative clinical effectiveness research is research that looks at different approaches to supporting that person and comparing them against each other to make sure that we know what really does work best in, in these situations. For this work, we have put together a multidisciplinary research advisory board representing people with dysgraphia, parents of children with learning disabilities, not just dysgraphia, but learning disabilities in, in, a, in a broader sense, um, 
both men and women, um, educators, clinicians, and researchers, because these are the members of who we see as our community and the people who are working on improving, improving things and also the people who are most directly impacted. So with this survey, we sought to develop um, tips sheets. And what these tip sheets are meant to do is increase engagement in research. Research, um, Jennifer and I have found, is something that is fairly new in the dysgraphia space. As I discussed earlier, there's not a lot of research going on currently in dysgraphia, and we know that there's a tremendous need for it. But in order to, in order to do meaningful research that impacts the, the people who are, are really dealing with these issues, we need to increase engagement from the community. So what we did is we used existing tip sheets that were developed on another project to engage mothers dealing with an issue completely unrelated to learning disabilities. But what we were curious about was whether these tip sheets aimed at engaging, at increasing engagement in research would resonate with our community, which is dealing with a different issue. Um, so we took the existing tip sheets on this other project and created a survey to determine how well the tips from this previous project resonated within our community. We had a hunch that we would we would see a lot of resonance um, between the two communities. But what did we want to learn by doing this survey? Firstly, we wanted to learn how you, our community, find information or seek information about learning disabilities. We also wanted to know what sources of information you find trustworthy. There are lots and lots of sources of information out there, and some of them are more trustworthy than others, and everyone has developed their own their own strategies to identify trustworthy information. We wanted to know where you would look for research information. Um, and we also wanted to know how you would want to interact with a research team. All of these questions are really moving us in the direction of understanding how best to engage our community in research. Why parents and guardians? Well, Parents and guardians were our, our primary target audience for this work. Number one, because there's a significant need. Parents and guardians are often helping to support kids who are in the ages that are really learning to participate in written expression. They're learning to read, they're learning to write, they're learning to spell, they're learning composition. Um, and we heard from so many parents and guardians that there was just such a need for support. Um, that's not to say that it's not important for, say, adults with dysgraphia, but by the time a lot of adults get to that point, they may have figured out some of their own accommodation strategies um, along the way. Um, the second thing is it is our largest audience. Uh, we have found over the last couple of years that we've been doing work with Dysgraphia Life that Parents and guardians are the ones who are coming to our website, who are coming onto our webinars, who are seeking out information. Um, and so we wanted to really focus on them. Um, we also were focusing on parents and guardians because this particular project with, or the survey with the tip sheets was relevant to the target population of mothers. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we were broadening that um, even though in a lot of the work that we've done, we have seen that it is um, oftentimes mothers who are attending the, um, the webinars, but we wanted to make sure it was inclusive. Um, and so we expanded it in that way. Okay, so um, the survey was entitled, How Do You Learn About Learning Disabilities? Um, we did an online survey plus a couple of interviews that sort of complemented the information we were gathering online. The survey was open from January 17th through April 3rd this year, um, and we did promote it on social media channels and online advertising. 
for parents and guardians of children with any type of known or suspected learning disability. That was our target audience. We didn't want to keep it narrow to dysgraphia because we also thought we could learn a lot about um, how parents of children with any type of learning disability find this information and participate in research. So 30, 333 people began the survey, 180 qualified, meaning they were over the age of 18 and they identified as a parent or guardian of a child with a learning disability or, or more than one learning disability. And they completed the entire survey. Um, we had representation from 32 states plus Puerto Rico, Australia, and Canada. And we'll dig a little bit more into the demographics of respondents in a little while. So who did we hear from? One of the key things we wanted to know about was what is your relationship to the person with a learning challenge? Um, as you can see, the overwhelming um, percentage of respondents identified as the parent of a child with dysgraphia. However, we were very pleased to see that we had about 10% of our respondents identified as a guardian. Um, in some cases, those might be grandparents um, or, or another family member who is, um, who is caring for, for a child, um, but see their role in this way. We also asked what type of learning challenges has your child been diagnosed with or do you suspect? And we did this as a please select all that apply because we know that oftentimes there are multiple learning disabilities or lear disorders or other neurodivergence, um, neurodivergent conditions that um, that all that that co-occur. So of course we had a high percentage of people whose whose children had dysgraphia, um, but we also saw high percentages of dyslexia, um, ADD, ADHD, dyscalculia, and smaller but significant percentages of nonverbal learning disabilities, oral written language disorders, and then a significant chunk of, of other, um, other issues. Um, as I discussed earlier in this conversation about targeting mothers, targeting parents, targeting guardians, um, the vast majority of the respondents did identify as female, um, although we did get some, some male respondents as well, um, which is we expected. Um, we also looked at race or ethnicity, um, and we had, you know, the overwhelming majority of respondents were white, um, with a smaller number of, of people identifying with other races or ethnicities. And we'll talk a little bit about, um, about what we do with that in a minute. We also um, wanted to know the highest level of education completed by the parent or guardian. Um, and as you can see, we had a pretty um, high percentage of respondents who had at least a bachelor's degree um, as far as educational attainment. Um, and fewer who had less than a bachelor's degree. So what I've just shown you is what we recognize as survey bias. Uh, we have a significant number of underrepresented groups here. Um, and that's something that we are trying very, um, very deliberately to, to remedy. Um, first of all, we likely don't have any information from people who don't have internet access. Um, and even in this day and age, there are still people who don't have internet access and we wanna know what, how they experience um, the questions that we were asking. Um, we also had less representation from people who had lower than a college education, college up level education, fewer men, fewer communities of color. Um, the additional phone interviews that we did were specifically to complement the survey data by specifically targeting people in these groups, um, but there's still more that we would really like to do to make sure that we are hearing all of those voices and that they're all represented in the work that we're doing. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer and she's going to talk about the rest of the research.
Thanks, Amy. Um, I think, nope, it's still says I'm muted. Get my screen sharing going. Okay. So now we're going to dig into the data. And the first part of the presentation is going to be about how parents and guardians are finding information, any type of information. There we go. So the first question on the survey really was what sources do you use to find information about learning disabilities? And this was a check all that apply. So what we found here was that the most commonly used sources were non-school-based professionals. So this was OTs, outside um, educators, they could have been educational therapists, occupational therapists, people outside of the general school district. Next, it was learning disabilities organizations, and then a whole smattering of books, social media, online forums, friends, healthcare provider. But I think what really struck us as we were looking through the data was how few people were getting information from their school about learning disabilities. So this is well under half, around 40% say that they are getting information from their school about learning disabilities. And these are parents of children with known or suspected learning disabilities, many of whom have children in school. So, you know, I, I found this somewhat surprising that it was so low, although when we showed this to our research advisory board, we heard from a lot of people that they weren't actually as surprised <laughs> that they have um, seen similar things where the information coming from the school has not been sufficient or parents are not going there first. So feel free to let us know in the chat what you think if this is a surprise to you. But I thought it was really telling that less than half of our parents are getting info about learning disabilities from their home school. So if you look at this last category, it's other please specify. And when we break out what a lot of people filled out others, these are the categories of things that people wrote in as to places that they are finding information. A lot of online information, internet searches, blogs, TikToks, comments from parents, chat GPT, asking questions of it. We had a number of people with research or professional backgrounds who talked about finding research articles, professional journals, using training resources that they got from their professional experience um, to really be able to learn in that way. Um, going through the process, the school-based process of 504s, IEPs, um, getting parent advocates, this advocacy experience really informed many people who completed the survey. Again, podcasts, visual media, podcast videos, different magazines and films around learning disabilities. And then the last category was collaboration and networking. So using peer groups, co-teachers, other professionals in social groups, but really trying to understand um, what other peers are going through and what that means for um yourself and how their experiences relate to yours was rated fairly highly. When we took all of these responses from the last question and these right in others, we asked people that we let them select all that apply first. And then we said, of these ones that you answered, what's the most valuable? Where do you get the most valuable information? And again, these non-school-based professionals came up first, psychologists, tutors, occupational therapists, et cetera with learning disabilities organizations coming in second. That other category came in third. So whatever they had written in for other, they felt that that was fairly valuable to them. Um, and then we saw books and a tie for fifth between healthcare providers and school-based resources, including the educators and administrators at their school. So again, while school also wasn't common, even people who said that they did receive school-based information did not rank it as the most valuable information they were getting. People really seem to be going outside to these non-school-based professionals to get the most and the most valuable information. So then we wanted to find out, you know, how do you determine if the information you've gotten 
is trustworthy? What, what are you using in your arsenal to try to understand the trustworthiness of the information? So this was sort of an agreement scale where people would say they agreed completely or they disagreed completely and rank it somewhere on that range. And what we found is there were really pretty high level agree of agreement with these first three. So looking at where the information is coming from and if it's a re reliable source, looking to see if they um, can find the same information on multiple places, multiple sites, and also continuing to ask questions, knowing that hopefully we're learning things and the information may change over time. In general, parents and guardians agreed with all of those. Interestingly, we saw a lot less agreement with opinion of a family member or friend really helping them decide if the information is to be trusted. While people somewhat agreed, it seems like they had a lot more faith in the information coming from reputable sources than what their family or friends may have thought about the information. So then we wanted to narrow down to sort of online sources and where do people specifically look if they're going online for learning disabilities information. And here learning disabilities organizations was at the top of the list, things like LDA, our site, other sites in the learning disability space. But we found that healthcare organizations came next, sites like the Mayo Clinic and others. Um, and then some people were looking at academic journals. After that, Facebook ranked the highest. There is some bias to that answer because we did do promotion on both Facebook and Instagram for the survey. So clearly Facebook users were often answering, but we saw a pretty good response on a number of different social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, um, as well as website blogs. But then when we asked about trustworthiness of the information that the parents and guardians were finding on those different sources, they had to rate the sources that they use and how trustworthy were they. The top three most trustworthy were in general averaged somewhere between some of they somewhat trusted and they completely trusted. They were somewhere in the middle of that range. And those were the learning disabilities organization websites, the academic journals, um, were trusted second most, and third was the healthcare organization websites. Under the least trustworthy sources, um, people didn't flat out say that they distrusted them, but they put them in the middle category around neither trust nor distrust, not sure what to make of the information. That's where most of the social media was ranked. So we saw Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube really among the least trustworthy data that people were citing when they're looking for learning disabilities information. So we did ask a free text question just to the parents and guardians who indicated that they had a student with dysgraphia because we are Dysgraphia Life, that is our level of interest. And we wanted to know what this group was really struggling the most when trying to support their student. And so these were the three sort of big categories that came out from all those written text responses. The first was just understanding and recognition. Um, there's a lot of confusion about if dysgraphia is just handwriting and many people felt that students had um, inadequate support, that symptoms were being misinterpreted, they were not getting diagnosed properly and not really getting that recognition that students even had dysgraphia. School support and advocacy was a huge issue of struggle, difficulty in getting schools to recognize dysgraphia, as I said, as well as to qualify students for school-based services, including IEPs and 504 plans. Um, they also felt that there was a huge need for advocacy efforts to support adequate services and accommodations in school. Much, much um, dismay about the, the resistance from certain schools about providing services to these students. And then the third category was really the impact on the student's self-perception and motivation. So they, there was a high level of concern about the emotional impact on the children, on self-esteem issues, on the anxiety, the frustration experienced by students who may be struggling with dysgraphia, particularly if it's not being recognized or supported properly in many settings. Um, so that concern about emotional output as well as 
the struggle to motivate the child to persist despite encountering many challenges and trying to explain and motivate about why it's still so important to improve writing schools even when it writing skills even when it's a struggle. So the takeaways from this section are that most parents and guardians are not getting their information on learning disabilities from their school. Instead, learning disabilities organizations and professionals outside of school are the most trusted, the most often accessed and the most trusted resources. We do see people doing a lot of online research. It can vary a lot from different sources, from websites to professional journal articles, podcasts, blogs, and online communities. However, while social media is used, it is not highly trusted in the way that some of the other sources are. And over and over, we see that there's a significant need for advocacy. So with this, we put together one of those tip sheets and uh, that we were showing, um, this is a draft of a tip sheet the, about how parents and guardians know which information to trust. And here we talked about some of the information that we just shared with you about where the information is coming from, that you can search for the same information more than once, um, that the information may change, as time over time, as researchers learn about it, you may need to keep asking questions. And here are some sources that other parents and guardians have mentioned that they found information. So for those who are on our webinar live today, we would love to get some feedback on what this, what you think of this type of tip sheet. Um, we're going to put a little poll out there, you should be able to see it. And so, hang on, that didn't show up right. Um, let me try it one more time. You launch the poll, continue. Can you see a question or can you see blank answers? Jennifer, oh, I see the question. There's okay. a question and then the, do you have suggestions for the tip sheet? So Okay, perfect. So it is correct on your end. I'm just seeing an odd screen. Um, so yes. So the answer is, would these tip sheets be useful to parents and guardians? Do you think anyone would use it? And then do you have any suggestions for this, how to make it better or um, what you think we could really do to help parents and guardians know what kind of information to trust? And we'll give you a minute, but we would really love to get any feedback from those who are on the call live to really um, see what you think of these and see if you have any suggestions as we move forward with this project. So all, all comments are appreciated on the tip sheets. I'll leave it open for another minute, but I will um, keep going to the next section, which is all about learning about new research findings and what we learned from our parents and guardians. So as we started to think specifically about new research findings as the information, we wanted to know how parents and guardians find out about new research that has happened. Some of the reason we want to do that is we want to help disseminate good evidence-based dissemination, good evidence-based studies, evidence-based information. And we want to know how we should be telling people about new research when we find it and we trust it and we want to um, really help get it out to the community. But also we're trying to grow the community of researchers. We're trying to make sure that more research happens and we really want to encourage people to work with researchers. So how do we encourage those researchers to tell the community about results too? So our first question was when it, it comes to learning about research, how do you prefer to receive information? Um, this is what we're, we thought a lot about because we're talking about the learning disabilities community, right? There's many, many, many people in our community who struggle with written expression, who struggle with reading. And we weren't sure that we thought whether written information would be valuable to parents and guardians. But to our surprise, that is what came up highest 
Um, we found that written online digital materials such as websites and blogs was actually how most people prefer to receive information. Again, there is some bias to this because it was an online survey. So it's for people who are going online anyway or taking the survey. Um, but, you know, it's it was this written digital information first and then second written printed information such as books, pamphlets and brochures that came out. We did see some interest in video such as YouTube or audio information such as podcasts, but not as much as we thought we might see. We thought we might see that everybody wanted video instead of written information, and that was not true in the end. So next, we gave parents eight statements and asked how much they agreed with them. You could put it on a scale from agreeing completely to disagreeing. Um, and we wanted to know, we have basically questions about when it comes to hearing about new research and learning disabilities, what do you think? What do you agree with? So the four things I'm going to show you were the things that most parents agreed with about hearing about new research and learning disabilities. So the first was that new research should give examples or references to everyday life. And that when you can explain it with references to everyday life, that helps understand complex ideas. And so as we kind of disseminate research information, we really should re relate it back to our community and relate it back to what's happening in their everyday life. Next, parents and guardians wanted to hear about the impact of the research and how does it inform your life decision? So not just what was the answer to the study, but how, what was the answer to this study and what does that mean? How does that change how I think about a situation, how I um, might make a decision about a potential intervention or support or something that my child needs, um, you know, based on that research output. Research findings should be written in plain language and not in overly scientific terms. We know that this can be a struggle sometimes for some scientists and clinicians who are, are very into the research that we really need to focus on, and there's a lot of groups doing it now, how to translate those scientific concepts into plain everyday language so that they're easy to read for anyone, even if you don't have a scientific background. And then the fourth thing that parents and guardians really agreed with was that researchers should communicate their findings in a way that's respectful of, as a, of me as a person, as well as my background and experiences. And this goes to the concepts of inclusion and equity that we really, we need to make sure that we are relevant for our whole community and being respectful to all different types of backgrounds. Um, and I think the learning disabilities community really feels this strongly. So the last section we're gonna talk about tonight is research involvement. So what did we learn about parents and guardians um, wanting to be involved in research and what that might look like and how can we do that better? Um, so for research involvement, first we were thinking about the concept that Amy sort of alluded to earlier of this person-centered research design. So what we've been thinking a lot about and what a lot of the studies that PCORI, our funding, funding agency for this project funds, are thinking about shifting the research model. So in traditional research, researchers really defined the priority. They said, this is the question I want to answer. And then they went out into the community and used the community as participants in that research. The new model is really to think about collaborative priorities. So how do you go out to the community and help the people in the community who that the research will eventually impact to define the questions, to define the study, to help you understand um, what really needs to happen with the research study from the very beginning. And how do we change the strategy to have members of the community and lots of types of stakeholders really involved in the study and the study teams? So what is engagement in research? How would we engage people in research? And this is the meaningful involvement of patients, in this case, people who are diagnosed, their caregivers, such as the parents and guardians, 
clinicians, other healthcare, in our case, educational stakeholders throughout the entire research process, planning the study, conducting the study, and then disseminating or spreading the study results. So when we started thinking about our parents and guardians and their involvement in research, we wanted to consider what if the parents are gonna participate in a research study? And there were sort of two flavors of this. One is participation as one of these partners that helps develop the research study that's part of the study team, or what if the parent or the student wants to participate as a study participant or both? And so first we asked about items that were important to parents and guardians and what helped motivate them. And basically there was a whole list of things that parents agreed with. They were very motivated to take part in research. They felt that their perspective and experiences were really important to share. They were motivated when it was a subject that they were curious about. Um, but there were a lot of logistical concerns that parents felt were important. So flexibility and scheduling, options for participating. We all know many things have moved to video conference and in Zoom. Um, how, could, how could you participate in a way that's convenient and flexible for you? They also talked about how they want to know that they can choose to not answer research questions if they're uncomfortable, they don't want to be judged by the researchers and research teams, and that privacy is important, and it's important that um, communications preferences are observed to really protect that privacy. So we wanted to know what someone would need to know if they were considering having themselves or a child participate in a research study about learning disabilities. How important is it for you to know the following information? And you can see just at a high level looking at this graph that some things were more important than other things to our audience of parents and guardians. Um, over on the left, we have things like what the study's about and what the researchers hope to achieve. Then many of those um, logistical things like the time and tasks involved, as well as the privacy and safety things, safety plans. Will the information be confidential? Um, people wanted to know that their participation makes a difference, that the researchers actually care about the community. On the other side, um, we saw that people, you know, were somewhat really somewhat enthusiastic about participation being voluntary, but then they weren't as concerned if people who were impacted by learning disabilities were involved in the study. I think that shifting of the model hasn't really gotten out there yet about how important it might be to have community feedback in the research process. And then this one in the last, on the very right, the last on our chart is, if I will receive a gift card or stipend for participating. So the parents and guardians in the survey overall really were more motivated by what the researchers hope to achieve in the study topics, as well as the logistics, and less about the financial support. However, we talked about the study bias earlier, and when you start to really dig into this information, you see a slightly different take on that last question about the gift card or the stipend for participating. So if you look at the specific time, we focus on just this question here and then look at some specific subgroups, the answer changes a little bit. So on the left is the all responses to that question, um, no matter what educational level the participant had. If you look in the middle, those are participants with master's degrees or above where less than 5% of people said that receiving a gift card or stipend was very important. However, if you go down and look at those who had less than a college degree, now it went up to 27.8% of people felt that the gift card and stipend was really important. There's still a large number that say not at all, but there's definitely a difference in an impact that may want, so that researchers may want to consider doing that so that they're getting um, a more diverse population into the study. We saw similar results if we broke this down by race and ethnicity, where the white Caucasian group really didn't say that the gift cards or stipends were very important, 
But if you looked at the Black African American or Latino population, there were really increasing amounts of people who felt that they should receive some sort of stipend or gift card for participation. So again, the study design and how you think about this could really impact the diversity of people who participate in the study and consequently how generalizable the study results are and if they really answer questions for a broader population. So we talked a little bit about social media, but we also asked um, when it comes to finding information about research on social media, how much do you agree with the following statements? You've been seeing the charts throughout this whole talk and in many of them, they were hugely green. Um, it, this one is not that way. So there was much less agreement around using social media to find research information than um, we saw in other areas of the survey. So some people said that they would participate in calls to action around research or would click on posts or would um, contact a researcher if they saw something, but we really didn't see a huge amount of agreement about like seeking out a study on a Facebook page or looking for information about research using specific hashtags. So what we're seeing is that the learning disabilities community really isn't taking to social media to look at research the way some other health conditions have really seen a big increase in research um, in, in their condition, often in um, rare diseases, there's a lot of research that's being put out on social media that's really not resonating for our community. So lastly, what we really asked about was the parents and guardians' interest in participating as one of those research partners. So as someone who helps design the study, someone who helps the researchers and research team, um, really is a partner on the research team playing an important role throughout the study. And we said, to, you know, we asked which of these things would you be interested in doing as a research partner? Now, a lot of people were interested in selecting the research topics. They have specific issues that they're dealing with that they think um, potentially we need some solutions to, that we need more research that we need to learn. So there was a high level of interest in selecting research topics, but then a very low level of interest in all the rest of these boxes on the slide. So people didn't feel that they should be sort of promoting the results, advising on whether participating in the study is feasible, helping interpret data in the end, which is interesting because we talked about how the interpretation and how it's relevant to your day-to-day -day life actually is important for people understanding it. Um, not a lot of interest in designing protocols, strengthening recruitment, or even participating in the data collection. So all of these, we could really use more awareness and more increased interest. So we would love to get any ideas from this group. You can respond in the chat if you have ideas, um, but how do we take this community and really increase interest in these different research tasks outside of the selection of research topics? Would love to get any thoughts. So takeaways from the research section are really that we found that the parents and guardians are motivated to participate in research. Um, there's a lot of important items to consider when you are thinking about research participation. The goals of the study and potential impact is one of the highest for most of the parents and guardians we heard from. Privacy and safety concerns and logistics also were very important. Um, most people in our community are not seeking out research information on social media. So that's something that we um, need to think about and make sure that they are do have easy mechanisms for getting research information and where they can find studies. Um, parents and guardians want to help select research topics that matter to the community, as I said, but they only had moderate interest in other ways to serve as a research partner. And that's something we really need to think about is how can we um, incentivize people and make people excited about the idea of helping create better research studies, studies that are more meaningful to the community. 
So with that, thank you for attending. We're thrilled that some of you wanted to learn all about the results of this study. I think we are going to take any questions at the end. If you have any, you can drop them in the Q&A, but we really appreciate it. We will be sending out a recording of this. Um, and I will also say that we have a lot of great webinars in the archive on the Dysgraphia Life, web the Dysgraphia Life website. If you go to the Dysgraphia webinar series section, um, you can go ahead and um, see the archive. If you scroll down to the bottom, all of the webinars are there. They're also on our YouTube channel. So you can look for them on YouTube and, as well. So we're happy to answer any questions. Um, I think Amy answered some already through the chat, but please feel free to put them in the Q&A section in the chat. And we really appreciate you being here. And with that, I will stop sharing my slides. I also did drop a um, poll in the chat about whether you enjoyed the webinar today. So um, please feel free to answer that too. I just wanted to note um, for, for those of you who weren't looking at the Q&A, there were a couple of really good questions. One was from um, Sarah who wondered about the trauma, about trauma and a link to learning disabilities and specifically child abuse, which obviously is a very, is a very sensitive subject, but um, notably she wonders, do you think a possible link could hinder honesty in research? Um, this is something that parents don't want to hear about and funding could be hindered because of it. Um, and then additionally, Matthew had asked questions about resources to help rural cities and small towns with limited funds. And I think that in both of those cases, um, both of those questions really speak to the importance of person-centered research and engagement. Um, and we talked a little bit about how we, um, we, we recognize that we have these underrepresented populations um, and we need to ensure that however we design research is, is representing all of those voices. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge those very, very good questions in the, in the Q and A.